knowing how your antennas work or build and optimize your own is very rewarding. Unfortunately, it needs know-how and some costly equipment to do that. Today we will change that and I show you an affordable new tool which enables these tasks. This small device was one of my best investments I made so far. Gritzy YouTubers, here is the guy with the Swiss accent, with a new episode and fresh ideas around sensors and microcontrollers. In video number 188, I tried to summarize my knowledge about antennas. There, it became evident that the performance of antennas is critical for successful communication links, especially if you are obliged to use low power. Good antennas not only help on the transmitter, but also enhance the receiving side. At the end, you know how to build and optimize a ground plane antenna. You will know how to tune a commercially available antenna. You will get a little theory behind it as usual. And you will know if this small thing is a gadget or a tool. The first antenna we will make is a so-called ground plane. This is, apart from the dipole, the most common antenna and it looks like that. A dipole, by the way, looks like that. What is the difference? To understand it, we have to start with our devices and with antenna cables. Our LoRa and Wi-Fi devices usually use SMA or IPX connectors and coax cable to connect them to the antenna. If we look at these connectors or the cables, we see that they always have two conducting parts. One is placed around the other. The outer is called shield and it makes sure that the cable, other than the antenna, does not radiate energy into the air. This is the main difference between cable and antenna. The inner part is the core and in between is an isolator. As we learned in video number 188, all cables and connectors have to have the same impedance. Otherwise, the energy is reflected back and is lost for our purposes. Most current RF devices use 50 ohms. So we have to use 50 ohm cables and also build a 50 ohm antenna. And as we see here, coax cables are not at all symmetric. The core looks completely different than the shield. This is why also our antennas have to be asymmetric. And here comes the difference between the dipole and the ground plane. The dipole is obviously a symmetric antenna and also has 75 ohms instead of 50 ohms impedance. I do not want to go further and introduce you into balloons, which is an abbreviation of balanced and unbalanced and can adapt dipoles to coax cables. For today, we stick to a ground plane. Why do I always talk about impedance instead of resistance? Nobody says that a 50 ohm resistor has a 50 ohm impedance and your multimeter also has a range to measure resistance, not impedance. I could go now into the next rat hole and explain complex numbers to you. No worry, I will not do that. The only thing we have to know today is that if we add capacitors or inductors to our circuits or antennas, they become an impedance instead of only a resistance. And the second thing we have to know is that capacitance and inductances are somehow opposite and can cancel themselves out if properly adjusted. Like the left and the right parties in Switzerland. They usually neutralize each other. This is the secret behind the Swiss stability. But do not tell it to somebody else. We want to keep it to our advantage. And this is more or less the whole story about antenna matching. We have to cancel inductances with capacitances and vice versa to come back to a pure resistance of 50 ohms. Unfortunately, other than resistors, capacitors and inductors are frequency dependent. If we, for example, measure the current flowing through a coil, we see that it apparently creates a short circuit for DC because in reality it is just a piece of wire. If we send alternate current through the same coil, the current decreases the higher the frequency is. The same happens with a capacitor just the other way around. It is a complete isolator for DC 
but conducts high frequencies without any problems. Knowing that, it seems to be evident that the cancelling out happens somewhere between DC and very high frequencies. Let's test and connect a power source to a capacitor and an inductor in parallel and measure how much power is transferred through them. We expect a curve like that. A low resistance or high power transferred when we use DC because the inductor conducts and transfers the signal without loss. The same should happen at high frequencies because the capacitor conducts. And in between we assume somewhere a minimum when both block about equally. Sounds quite logical. And if we check it out with the spectrum analyzer, we see a minimum power transferred around 40 to 50 MHz in our case, depending on the size of the inductor and the capacitor. We call this frequency resonance frequency. Antennas are not very different and therefore behave also similarly. Their inductive and capacitive part cancel out at the resonance frequency. The difference is that we usually do not see a coil or a capacitor. They are somehow built in. To show you the effect, I still had to use my expensive spectrum analyzer. Not as promised, a cheap device. Just a few seconds and we will be there. One last thing I did not mention so far is the phase. In a resistor, the current and the voltage run in parallel. If the voltage increases, the current increases as Ohm's law says. In capacitors and inductors, this is not the case. The current leads or lacks the voltage by a particular time, or as the mathematicians say, a phase. And their phases are opposite. This is why they can eliminate themselves. You can imagine that knowing this phase is essential if you want to distinguish between a resistive, a capacitive or an inductive impedance. In plain English, if you can measure the phase of your signal, it is easier to detect where the antenna has 50 ohms without anything else. Unfortunately, spectrum analyzers can not measure phase of the signals. And here comes my new toy into the game. Because it can measure power and phase, it belongs to the family of vector network analyzers, abbreviated VNAs. The manufacturer calls it N1201A, Vector Impedance Analyzer, because it does not have all the features of a VNA. But it is very similar. It produces curves that resembles the one of a spectrum analyzer and it also works somehow similar. It has a built-in sender and a receiver. But as said before, it can also measure the phase of a signal. Let's look at the small device, which sells for less than $150. Apparently, it does not have all the bells and whistles of a spectrum analyzer. Just count the number of buttons. And it has only one connector instead of two. But it is optimized for antenna tuning. And it works from 137 megahertz to 2.7 gigahertz which includes all our LoRa bands and 2.4 GHz Wi-Fi. And it is straightforward to use. Let me show you. I quickly built a ground plane antenna using an SMA connector and some copper wires and connect the N1201A instead of the transceiver to the antenna. I want my ground plane for 868 MHz and therefore calculated the length of the five wires. 8.2 centimeters each. Because my father always told me that it is easier to cut than to extend, I cut the wires longer initially. Because I do not know where the resonance frequency of my new build is, I start the scan at 700 megahertz and end it at 1 gigahertz. And look what we get on this beautiful color display. Do you understand now my feelings? In seconds we get a simple and clean curve. On the y-axis we see the famous VSWR introduced in the last antenna video and on the x-axis the frequency. If we place the marker at the minimum of the curve we see that the resonance frequency is too low. Is this because of my father's rule? Let's check and play hairdresser. 
We start with a majority, the four wires pointing to the ground, and cut them a little. Not too much, cutting is easy. Nothing happens. Not good. Like with the politicians, if a method does not work, we just use more of it and cut again. But still no effect. As engineers, we know when the methods are not useful and when we have to try a different route. Therefore, I try the only small guy at the top and cut it also a little. Now we immediately see what happened. The resonance frequency moved up. Did I already mention that I love this small analyzer? Next cut, same result. Now we are confident and reduce the frequency span to 800 to 900 MHz and the marker at 868 as a goal. Cut and cut and cut a little more and here we are. The resonance frequency is at exactly 868 MHz. We cut the four radials to the same length just because we can and because it looks better. And our first antenna is done. Did I say how much it cost? For sure less than a dollar. Now we could stop this video because you are now experienced in antenna optimization. Not on this channel. I'm sure you want to know if this N1201A is only a gimmick or if it displays the truth. You are not alone. This is why I met two fascinating fellow ham operators, Christoph and Frank, at a very nice place to test if it is any good. And because Christoph is a professional in antenna design, he also owns the right equipment for this test. His antenna analyzer is made for troubleshooting LTE and other antennas. And it is for sure good enough for me. During an evening we compared the two devices with various loads, antennas and filters. In the end the verdict was clear. Absolutely usable. For our purpose we did not find any significant differences between the readings of the expensive and the cheap device. Did I already mention? that I love this little tool? Now we can have some fun. First I want to test an antenna I bought as 868 MHz antenna. Is it worth the money? Unfortunately it does not resonate at 868. It resonates way below that frequency. So I cut it open and surprise surprise. This mismatch remembers me at a situation in some of our urinals where we find this sign. Joking apart, look at this. After removing the plastic it is spot on 868. If I put the plastic back on, back to the original resonance. Crazy. How would you know without this new tool? By the way, did I already mention that? Stop. Now it should be clear to everybody. A closer look shows that also this antenna consists of two parts, a wire and a spring. I have to tell you, I did this already with another antenna. Then it was useless to cut the wire and as said before, I'm no politician. So this time I cut the spring. And really we can trim this antenna to 868 with the cap on. Now a little super glue and a heat shrink tube and a perfectly optimized antenna is ready. Three additional things have to be mentioned. These VNAs, also the professional ones, have to be calibrated using three distinctive loads. An open, a short and a 50 ohm resistance. You can buy such calibration sets on AliExpress. Our N1201A measures the reflected power from the antenna, also called S11 in VNA lingo. If you want to go further with your analysis you can buy a true VNA, also not too expensive. It is called Tiny VNA Mini. I have here the Plus version which is more temperature stable. It has a PC interface and can draw, amongst others, so called Smith charts. And it can also measure other S values like S12, S21 and S22. Summarized, we built a ground plane antenna optimized for 868 MHz. Of course, the same procedure can be used for all other frequencies.
I introduced you to my new tool, the N1201A Vector Impedance Analyzer, and showed how easy it is to visualize antenna behavior. By the way, you can buy other versions of this analyzer, which also cover lower frequencies, and even one with two connectors. We discussed the difference between a spectrum analyzer and a vector network analyzer in respect to antenna optimization. We also optimized one of my China antennas using the same technique. Then, as usual, we had a glimpse at the theory behind all this black art. All in all, it never has been easier to work with antennas. I have no clue how I did live without my new tool. Measuring responses of antennas in seconds and display it in a curve, portable, accurate and cheap has never been possible. And its range is up to 2.7 GHz. You find all the links in the comments. I hope this video was useful or at least interesting for you. If true, please consider supporting the channel to secure its future existence. You will find the links in the description. Thank you. Bye. By the way, the Smith chart shown before is the result of the measurement of this do-it-yourself collinear antenna. Can you tell if this antenna is good or bad?